Yes, Mr. Squire. Um, uh, my Lords, I represent the appellant in this appeal with uh, my own friends, Ms. Davies. Uh, the respondent is represented by Mr. Sheldon QC, with Ms. Cumberland, and uh, Mr. Tank. Um Can I just check you've got, you should have a core bundle, it should have the skeleton in hand. Um, Lady Justice Nicola Davies. We've got uh, order. We've got skeletons. Uh, we've got uh, core bundles, supplemental bundle, and authority bundle. Thank you. Uh, well, you should also have a note from us from yesterday. Yeah. Yes. Um, uh, we also note, I apologise for this, that some of the statutory material we've included in the bundle is the current versions of statutes yeah. rather than ones at the material time. Yeah. Um, we have the um, ones at the material time with us, but I can also get, they, they, they appear elsewhere in the bundle. If, if you're happy to hand them Let's up, we'll give you the reference. Elsewhere in the bundle, uh, unless we need the further copies. Yes, I mean, it, just for your note, they're, they're set out. It's sections 250 and 255 A and C, um, and they appear in full in our uh, statement of facts and grounds, page 331 and 334. In the correct form. In the form, yeah, in the form that was enforced at the material. The pre-sentencing code form, the post lapo but the pre-sentencing act form. Probably, probably, my lord. It's the ones that were enforced at the time that the relevant decision, that the change was made. And, and section 250 also appears in full in the judgment of the division yeah. court. Um, um, my lords, uh, unless um, it would assist me to do otherwise, I was going to deal first with the proportionality duty of candour. Yes, uh, and deal with it in any order you like. Uh, I'm grateful. So as we've got two hours for this, and uh, um, obviously you can take up the large proportion of it, but I think you should leave a little time for Mr. Shell. Of course. Of course. Um, so, so beginning with that uh, ground, I say we, we dealt with that in our note of yesterday, uh, and you'll see uh, in our note we set out, started with three propositions, which we understood weren't in dispute, at least at this stage of the proceedings. Um, and the first proposition, which is at paragraph three of our, of our note, um, concerns the material about uh, Usman Khan that emerged at the inquest uh, into the Fishmonger Hall uh, murders. Uh, and you'll see from our note, it's three, uh, three points that emerge, or three key points that emerge from, from the evidence. Um, the first you'll see is that he was, he was regarded by numerous people at the time of his release in December 2018 as highly dangerous. There's considerable evidence of serious and ongoing commitment to extremism, which did not appear to have waned at all throughout his sentence. And there was also intelligence, I think two months before he was released, that he was planning, uh, planning to return to terrorism. Uh, second, uh, we say from what emerged at the inquest, there was little or no basis for concluding that in the 11 months he spent on license, the risk he posed had reduced substantially or, or at all, or that he'd abandoned extremism, had a, some significant change of heart. And indeed, certainly evidence emerged at the inquest of concerns during the licence period as well, particularly in the, towards the end of the 11 months he spent on licence. At third, it appeared from the inquest that there may have been serious failures in Mr Khan's supervision both in assessing his risk and ensuring information available about the danger he posed was properly passed on to those most immediately responsible for supervising him, and in particular, those who must have made the decision to allow him to travel to London uh, on the day of the conference on the 29th of November 2019. Um, we set out in our skeleton a little more detail where we get those, those three propositions from. Um, uh, for my Lord's note, I wasn't going to take you to them, but it's, it's 21 uh, to 24. Um, we set out uh, the position as of the date of release and the various bits of evidence we rely on, uh, the position what happened in the 11th month, in the 11 months, and particularly our submission, there was certainly no evidence that an individual who was regarded as highly dangerous uh, in December. But the problem is you've got to go back to November 2019 and December 20. 19, there had been a major terrorist attack in London where two people had died. They had other people, including the co-accused, on license, and there were concerns, naturally, that something might have gone wrong somewhere in the system. And ultimately, they didn't change this condition because Mr Khan 
and to kill two people. They did do that multi-agency assessment and the extreme risk guideline assessment, and, and they took a view on him. So whatever triggered it, and certainly in the early days, you wouldn't have expected them to say, before we do anything with uh, Mr. Latif, we must check fully all the records with Mr. Khan. Wasn't this just a trigger to do the assessment for this appellant? We'll, we'll accept, what we'll see when we we'll come to the facts in a moment is that what the Secretary of State's decision was to change the licence conditions for all terrorism offenders. Mm. That, that was the decision that was taken. Um, and the rationale for that, as we'll see in a moment, to say the rationale that was presented to the, the court, was what the attack showed was um, these sort of incidents, these sort of events are unforeseeable. As I say, and that's the, you see from our skeleton, we've distinguished between attack that, we accept this attack was not, for, was unforeseen, at least by those supervising, immediately supervising uh, Mr. Khan. But um, what appeared to be the justification for changing, or the attempt to change the license conditions of every terrorism offender was the lessons that one took from the London Bridge Fishmonger Hall attack. So, so our submission is, um, and, and say at this stage, um, we're not suggesting um, that if um, material which we say should have been provided, had been provided, the Division Court was bound to find, to reach a different conclusion. That isn't the test we need to overcome at this stage. The question is, was this relevant or material to the issues that it was determined? And I appreciate I need to establish that, but not necessarily this court isn't, we respectfully say, stepping to the shoes of the Divisional Court and saying, well, um, it was bound to decide uh, in your favour. We accept that if we're right, what should happen is if the appeal is allowed, it's remit, and the division court can look at this and say, well, um, this may have made a difference, would have made a difference uh, to our decision. So, so to answer my Lord's question, our submission is, and we'll see this in the division court judgment, it specifically dealt with this when it looked at the decision-making process. And it noted there were some specific issues about this uh, Pellon because he was a co-accused but in fact that's not really the basis for the decision because it was a decision taken across the board and that's our which is it, it is then critical what lessons one draws from the uh, London Bridge attack um, so well, th those are my first and, uh, but I certainly will, will address that because obviously it is critical I, I must establish it, it was at least relevant or material perhaps given this is a permission to appeal at least it's not fanciful that an appeal court would conclude um, it, it was relevant and material um, so that's the first, um, uh, our first proposition. Um, the second proposition, which again um, we don't understand to be disputed, is none of that material, none of what we set out in paragraph three of our note, was before the divisional court, and no indication of any of that was before the divisional court. One thing said by the Secretary of State in his skeleton, this is a, a paragraph 46, it, he says this, the suggestion that a properly conducted judicial review of um, the decisions in question ought to have included a disclosure exercise of thousands of pages of Khan's prison record for the purpose of comparing his behaviour in custody with that of a claimant is manifestly unsustainable. But that, that isn't what's required. The, the duty of candour is not, we look very briefly at citizen, the Citizens UK case, it's not a, it's not a disclosure obligation. It's an obligation to ensure the court has the complete picture. Um, the relevant not, facts and information underlying the decision that was taken. Correct, yes. And the decision, yes. Um, and as I say, but as I say, we'll come back to this. In our, our submission, the decision here uh, is the decision to change the license conditions of all terrorism offenders. Um, that, is, that is what underpinned the decision. That is what was, that is, and that is what the Secretary of State sought to do. So, uh, but of course, I accept that. It's, it's uh, um, disclose until underlying the decision, and I will come back to that. Um, but it's to provide an information to give the court an accurate explanation of all relevant facts in relation to that to that decision. It's not an obligation to make disclosure of some particular documents. It's the court must have the full picture. Third proposition, uh, which again uh, I, I don't understand to be disputed, is what's required uh, of the duty of candour. Um, Again, I don't think I need to take you to that. We set out paragraph 44 of our skeleton, um, what he said in the Citizens UK case. Um, uh, oh, perhaps it might help just like a point to the key, the key parts for our purposes. It's 
page 44 of the Cool Bundle. We quote from uh, Lord Justice Singh in paragraph 5 of our skeleton when no, he summarises the core The Cool Bundle is what? Core Bundle, page 44. Yeah, but what is it? What is the core? Uh, what what document? Oh, I apologise. Our skeleton argument. I apologise. Your well, which paragraph is it? In it paragraph five of our skeleton argument. Yeah. Sorry. And then you'll see the first point made is uh, the one I was just making. Disclosure is not automatic in the sense of disclosure of documents. And then the description of the duty of candour in three. Due to assist the court with full and accurate explanation of all the facts relevant to issues which the court must decide. And then further down at five, duty to disclose all material facts known to a party in judicial review proceedings. Duty not, not to mislead the court can occur by omission, for example, by non disclosure or by failing to identify the significance of a document or fact. <clears throat> and then in dealing with the facts, you'll see, uh, again in paragraph six, or Justice Singh explains, court shouldn't be left with an incomplete picture, uh, whether that's intentional or not. Significant evidence needs to be brought to the attention of the court. Um, as I said, I don't understand that those three propositions are, are disputed. Turning to the issues that are in dispute, um, the first is, was, was it relevant or material to any issue the divisional court was determining that, uh, the various points I made as my first proposition, Mr. Khan was regarded at the time of release as a highly dangerous individual, etc. little or no basis, concluding he had changed significantly on licence, appears there may well have been serious failures in his assessment. The question is, is that evidence, is that information relevant or material? What's it got to do with the assessment of this defendant? Um, because it was um, the basis. Well, we'll see when we when we look at the explanation for. for why, why is it not the trigger, my lord's mention, um, for the assessment of Mr. Latif? Because the decision was taken uh, in relation to all defend all. So, so what? I mean, you you know you consider yeah you consider the thing because you've had a trigger. Something has happened that was bad. But, uh, I mean, the detail of that bad event is not relevant to the decision that was taken in relation to Mr. Latif, is it? It depends what lessons one takes from the London but Bridge attack. This was November 29th. Two people were killed. By the 13th of December, two weeks later, before there'd been the full investigation into Mr. Carl and why he came and did what he did, I mean, you're, you're trying to say what? That they couldn't have reached a decision to take steps to impose new conditions, which would be accompanied by multi-agents assessments and new cases, that that somehow can't happen unless they first identify the level of risk arising out of Mr. Khan's proposal. But, but no, it is. Firstly, the issue before the court in relation to necessity was about necessity, the continuing necessity yeah. of, of, of the chain. So it's, it's the period up until the hearing, so a, a year and a half. The assessment in August and September 2020, we mustn't forget the assessments and the specific assessments uh, of your client. And there were still concerns about him in August and September. Um, uh, my lords, my lords, uh, or, or, uh, that's correct, but again, all of this come back, come back to, we say, uh, is at least a relevant factor, and we're saying it certainly appears to be in the Division of Courts uh, judgment what lessons one takes from the London Bridge attack. Whether one takes the lesson from that, um, terrorism attacks of this kind are inherently unforeseeable. If one takes that, that appears to be the lesson that was drawn, and that is a part of the decision-making process. And that is why I say my submission only has to say that that was relevant, not that we necessarily would have bound to succeed if that was taken into account. And we do say that was relevant because it was a key part. If you'd made a specific disclosure application for the prison records of Mr. Khan, would you have got them? Whether we would have got each, uh, 
whether we've got every page of his records, we, what we should have got would be an account of no, no, the danger. No, no, you made a specific third uh, application, because if they had, on your case, failed to comply with their duty of candor, the consequence of the two further control inferences, or it triggers a specific application for disclosure. So the question is, if you had made an application for disclosure in public law for the prison records of Mr. Khan to do with his risk, would you have got them? Well, we would, given the way in which the case was being presented. We do say we do say it was relevant. It's not, as I said, it's not only his his prison records that were relevant. It's not only his time in prison that was significant. It was also significant. As I say what lessons one takes from the attack, which includes what happened afterwards, whether there were serious mistakes made. We say that is if there was a le if the wrong lesson was drawn, which led to a blanket change of policy in all cases, that, that would give rise to a different argument, potentially. But if there is a following whatever the lesson, whether rightly or wrongly taken, there are individual assessments. I just don't see what possible complaint you've got with that. Because the individual assessments are taken in the light of um, the understanding of the attack. Otherwise, it's not simply a trigger. Because one, one can entirely see, and we'll see where, where the divisional court dealt with it, one can entirely see the logic of changing license conditions if what the London Bridge attack showed was here you have someone who is um, progressing. November, the dying days of November and the early days of December, you wouldn't have known what lessons you could have drawn. You knew that two people had been killed by somebody who was on license. You also knew, as it happened, that he was a co accused of this particular person. And the evidence of Hannah Williams was that she was worried that she was dealing with some of the co accused of Mr. Khan. And then, certainly, because of the way the system works, there's a multi agency assessment which has a wide range of statutory bodies taking part. And there are these ERG, extremist risk guidelines assessment. So, whatever triggered it, by the time of the hearing, there had been individualized assessment of the appellant. So whatever the trigger, whatever the lessons you would ultimately learn, and they didn't come out until the inquest, the focus on this appellant had been fact specific to him, at least by August, September 2020, hadn't it? Well, again, it's, um, you, you have my submission. My submission is that that, only, that exercise only makes sense in the context in which it was, in the context in which it was carried out. And, and the reason I say that, and, and as I said, it was the, the case that was being put, certainly what we understood the case that was being put, as to why, um, why um, the, the Usman Khan attacks led to this man's uh, license conditions being changed. It's not simply this was a trigger, and then whatever we thought about Mr. Khan is then put to one side. We now make an entirely, if you like, fresh and untainted decision about this man, unsurprisingly given what had happened uh, at Fishmonger Hall. When one's then looking at uh, Mr. Latif, one is doing that bearing in mind what, un what one understands had happened. Uh, and in response to my, my Lord's point about uh, what, happened imme what, what happened immediately, our focus in the necessity argument was not necessarily about the first week or two afterwards. One can see that certainly in that, the very initial period there were concerns was there going to be a copycat attack, et cetera. There may be all sorts of them. And I think um, we accepted that the, and the, the, the focus of the argument was what happens, what's happening months, a year later. And, and our, our case is simply that it is a relevant part of that, um, what one learns from the London Bridge attack. And perhaps I can put it the other way round in terms of proportionality, which is that if it was correct that the lesson of the London Bridge attack was um, these sort of things are inherently unforeseeable. You can have an individual who seems to be progressing very well, but they can suddenly do something unforeseeable. The way in which you then assess individuals is going to be quite different, is our submission, because... I don't see why that follows. Um, if, the, if the lesson you've learned is that people you think may no longer be highly dangerous, may in fact be highly dangerous. What you do is you reconsider in an individual's case whether in fact he is still highly dangerous. But well, well, yes, but if you then, for example, don't particularly find signs that they're highly dangerous, 
you're very likely still to continue to think, well, we didn't spot those signs of Mr. Khan either. Why does that follow? That, that's a wholly different argument. It's about the process of assessment. Well, one would know because, well, our, our submission is, is no, because um, if one's starting point is people, uh, this type of offender may well hide whether they're dangerous, they may well um, appear to be complying, but in fact are highly dangerous. One is going to conduct the assessment in a different way than if one starts with the, the if one starting point is no, the London Bridge attacks but were. Paragraph um, 58 of the judgment, Mr. Squires, the court deals with this. There had been the relevant assessments on the 4th of September 2020. The notice of the meeting showed some risks are partially present and some have reduced. Some of the requirements for the. So, EU, sorry, my lord, which, which paragraph? 58 of the judgment. Some of the requirements, such as the electronic tag, could be removed, but work remained to be done uh, and the other conditions should remain in place. And that was based on expert assessments. They made an assessment in August, as it happened in September, and the answer was this man still presents some risk. Oh, my lord, but as I say, you, you, you have my submission. Uh, my submission is that anything, all that happens subsequently, um, is done in response to and in the light of um, the London Bridge attack. Um, and it depends, and I say our case is, does not need to go further and say it was at least relevant what the correct lessons, relevant to the exercise of the Divisional Court was conducting. And what the evidence that you rely on, that it was all done because of the lessons learned from the London attack, which, which Mr. Reid gives specific evidence about his concerns about people on licence, which evidence are you referring to? That it was the understanding of the London Bridge attack that yeah. led to the uh, licence change. I can. Um, That's in paragraph 11 of the judgment. Um, if one looks at the judgment under appeal, and that was focusing on the period on licence. So the court seems to have focused on the licence period. I mean, the, 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 the paragraph 39 explains the process. And the concern you'll see there in the fifth line is, is why, the, why generic concerns were raised. Mr. Reid explained the fear was that those who had followed the same process of rehabilitation as Khan might equally remain predisposed to violent extremist action. But you've got to read paragraph 11, and you can go back to the evidence, and Mr. Reid was only giving evidence, as you were told, about the period on licence. He didn't express views about the period prior to licence, and his concern was, gosh, we've got these people on licence, we are the probation service, what happens if we are wrong, and we think people are doing well on licence? And we think they can go alone to meetings, and it goes wrong, and people are killed. It seems to be what 11 and 39 are dealing with. Well, as I say, well, I mean, our submission, I'll come, I'll come briefly to the other, the yeah. paragraphs in this Williams statement, which is which the mm, um, yeah. Secretary of State also relies on. Um, our submission on that is that. Um, what was being suggested, and again, one can see the logic of it, is that um, this attack appeared to be something unforeseeable. Well, why don't you give us the pages with the evidence that you say says that, rather than your understanding of it? Um, Which witness <coughs> are you relying on in the supplementary bundle? There's Mr. Reid. There's, well, there, well, there's, there's, first, there's first the pleadings. Well, we know that the pleadings say it because the, state, the summary grounds and the detail grounds say it. We've seen the correspondence that you drew attention to, which says, no, that's not what we're actually saying, and you can argue about that. But if we look at the evidence which was before the court, because pleadings are not evidence, even in judicial review, and the evidence was Mr. Reid and Miss Williams particularly, and Mr. Reid was dealing with the licence position. That's what troubled him, and that's what Miss Williams, she was the probation officer, thought, goodness, what am I going to do now? Um, she what, said she had a very anxious weekend. She didn't know what she was going to do. Well, what Miss Williams said um, 
the, the four paragraphs I think that are picked up on by the respondents at paragraph 44. Yeah. 44 of Hannah Williams. Yes, it's page 218. And it's the final line that deals with the, the Usman Khan, how Usman Khan was understood. Yeah. Usman Khan perpetrated this attack despite being released on license and progressing well enough over the eight months or so on license to be permitted to travel to London alone. How does that say that it was the underlying concerns about his progress in prison and so on that the can I, show you, can I show you the four, the four paragraphs and I'll, I'll make the, the submissions? Um, paragraph 49 is the... And the bit about what the attack had demonstrated is just at the... It's at the, the three-quarters of the way down. Yeah. Usman Khan's attack had demonstrated a manner that we had not previously appreciated. Even those who appeared to show progress still remain capable of holding on to their terrorist identities and opposing a continuing threat to national security. Um, yeah. um, that we do say is an incomplete picture if one knows uh, about the state, uh, his state of mind when he was released, because there was there was no evidence, or it is no surprise that he continued to hold a terrorist identity, um, given that. At the time he was released, he was regarded as a high-ranking terrorist prisoner involved in radicalisation and intimidation. We do say that is not, and no one says this is any deliberate attempt to mislead, but that is not a complete picture of, Usman, of the attack perpetrated by Usman Khan. That is not a, given what's known at the inquest, there will be no surprise that he had maintained his terrorist identity and posing a continuing threat to national security. Um, 69F, I think, is the third. And this is done chronologically. The first, the paragraph 49 deals with what you were thinking on the 2nd of December. And when you get to 69F, that's what you were thinking, I think, on the yeah, 4th of December. Yes, and you'll see it's the... You're uh, the link. My Lord, yes, you'll see this is... You've been assessed as posing a high risk. He blinks, but can't. Um, nature of offending, the significant term of imprisonment, uh, and this was, but well, yes, this, this is a list of the, the discussion of matter was informed by the following consideration, and there's then the, the list at sixty nine, uh, and then again one deals with Usman Khan sixty nine F, um, towards the bottom of the page. There'd be nothing in his pattern of behaviour which suggested his risk profile had changed or that he was about to carry out an attack. Um, but this is talking again about the time that he was on license. I understand that you can say that if only they'd gone back earlier, but this witness was only dealing with her concerns about his progress on license, having itemised her concerns about Mr Latif personally. I'm not sure where we get that this is only concerns about him on, on license. He'd been released on license in December 2018. He's considered to be compliant and engaging and had worked closely with professionals, i.e. on licence, to the extent that he'd been permitted to travel alone to an event in London. He'd been participating in all relevant programmes and attending regular meetings with his probation officer. There'd been nothing in his uh, pattern of behaviour which suggested that his yeah. risk profile had changed. She, we can read it, come to a view, but isn't she really, on any fair reading, dealing with the period on licence? Well, his risk profile is certainly the impression one would get from is that he had a risk profile of someone who was unlikely to commit a terrorist attack. That's what, and, and that was also in the in the pleadings that we picked up on as well. But what we understood from this was that this was someone with a risk profile who would not be expected to commit a terrorist attack. It, it appears that the opposite is the case. That the risk, pro, the correct risk profile, one would never do a risk profile only looking at someone's conduct on license. Not least, and I'll come on to it in a moment. The conduct on license doesn't really make any sense unless you know um, the nature of the risk he posed um, when he left custody. And then I think the fifth, the, the fourth one. Is at 87. I 
think uh, relates to my, my Lord's question. This is now 12 13th of December. And it's the last, again, this is the paragraph of the Secretary of State realizes it's the last sentence. Furthermore, reflections on Muslim Khalifa, despite demonstrating positive shifts in ideology, an individual could commit further attacked offences. And again, in terms of a complete picture, there was no evidence, it appeared from the inquest, demonstrating positive shifts in his ideology. As I say, again, if one knows what his ideology was when he left custody, there was no suggestion, given quite how dangerous he was and given his extremist commitment, that that ideology had changed in any significant, to any significant extent. Um, in answer more generally to, to my Lord's point about, well, this was all about progress on license. Um, the issue in candor is not um, simply, or not simply, it, you cannot say, make statements that are untrue. It goes beyond that. It's about, from, it's about ensuring the court has a complete picture. And of the relevant issues, which is whether or not this appellant should have been subjected to a condition in December 20. Which should be maintained up to and including the time. Of uh, correct. Well, I know, yes, and, but but just but just and I'll come back to that that in a moment. I know I've already made the submission, which um, yeah. but um, um, in terms of the complete picture, my law put to me, well, this is all about what he was doing on license. So the paragraphs that we've seen. Um, um, first, as I say, most of these do not. Do not, or some of them certainly do not appear to, and our impression about risk profile was not, um, we built up his risk profile only by looking at what he did on license, not least because that would be, uh, frankly, a bizarre way of conducting the assessment. But in terms of a complete picture, if one wants to understand his risk and whether the attack was foreseeable or not, um, one would need to understand what he did on license in relation to, or one would need to know. Um, what his risk was when he left prison because if one has for example someone who leaves prison um, rehabilitated relative assessed to be a low risk and then on license as we're told about Mr Khan well he doesn't breach his license he appears to be at least cooperating um, one would say well that is someone who we it will be out of the blue for them then to return to terror I thought he was released automatically sorry I thought he was released automatically what he was. Yes, so there was no assessment that the parole board didn't say he's now safe to go. No, it's, it's, no, it's not. It's, it's not the parole board. It's all the others who did assessments yes. of him. No, no, it, it's, there was no parole board assessment. It was others who were, who were uh, psychologists that assessed him a year before, etc. Uh, 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 all those other individuals. Um, the submission is this. If one is, um, one cannot look, one would not conduct any sort of meaningful risk assessment simply by saying, well, he appeared to be cooperating um, and he hadn't breached his license. Um, if one is trying to see um, what his risk is, as I say, a person who had left prison, rehabilitated, low risk, and then cooperated in the community, one would say, well, that, we assume he has a low risk. If you have someone like Mr. Khan, given the assessment made of him by the various professionals when he was released, saying, well, he hasn't breached his license, he seems to be caught in, really doesn't tell you very much about what his risk was as of that day. That's why we say a complete picture if one is trying to work out what lessons one draws from the London Bridge attack requires one to know significant, very significantly more than was put before the Divisional Court. Uh, and my Lord, in, in terms of the, the primary uh, issue that uh, I appreciate is concerning the court as to whether, well, he was then assessed. Well, I, I think, my lords, you have, you have my submission, which is that the, the exercise was conducted um, in response to and, in rela and with a particular understanding of what had happened in London Bridge. It was, we say it was more than the truth. Is there any evidence at all that the multi-agency assessment said something along the following lines? We wouldn't have recommended the continuation of the conditions, but for the fact of Usman Khan, you must have evidence for these statements, Mr. Uh, yeah, it was paragraph 69, the one we saw, that the start of that list was the discussion map was informed by the following considerations. And then the, and then the list, and that was where we got the... But 
but I thought this was all about December 2019. The Wouldn't multi-agency assessment and the extremist risk guidance assessments I thought were August. September 2020. The, the extremist risk was. The, the, oh, so I understood the multi agency is MAPA. We, we thought, yeah. I thought that was the. So the MAPA was. The, the MAPA begins on, um, in December 2019. And that's the. Well, there was a multi agency uh, meeting in December 2019, but there were further ones and further assessments. They don't just have one now, as I understand it. Well, yes, I'm afraid I don't think we have the, the risk assessment here, so I'm not able to make the, 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 yeah. the summer risk assessment. So I'm not able to make any submissions on that. So all what I've got is by September 2020, South Cross 57 and 58, which is the extremist risk guidelines assessment, and the multi agency one on the 4th of September. And those say that this appellant presented some risk, although there had been some improvement and some easing of the condition. Yes, well, yes, I can't, I can't, I can't take that any further. I can only make the, the only submission I can make, as I say, is that that's the, um, what I showed you from the, the MAPA, the original multi-agency MAPA meeting in December. We have the, the matters that were a concern to them, um, and that included the understanding of, of the London Bridge attack. Um, Manuels, that was the, the duty of candour, the candour point. As, as I say, the, the, I do accept, I need to establish that it's at least um, not fanciful that this was relevant material. Um, if, if it was relevant material, we do say it's clear that it wasn't before the court and the court didn't have a complete picture. But, but of course, if the court's against me that it's not, even for a permission to appeal context, uh, relevant or material to any issue the division court was deciding. Um, then that, that ground would fail that hurdle. Um, can I deal next with the uh, Article 14 ground? We put this as grounds one to three, but it's it maybe more helpful just to see it as a, a single ground as it was. It was ground one, um, ground one below. A and of course, for this, I need uh, um, the Divisional Court refused permission to bring judicial review. So this is a, um, this would be an appeal against. Uh, against the decision to refuse permission. Um, in our skeleton in, in relation to this, which you have at um, page 24, and it's, um, it's paragraph 21, we set out essentially what the, the Article 14 issue is in this case. And what you're doing is comparing two categories of prisoner. Um, prisoner sentence under, such as the appellant's sentence under section 227, ext an extended sentence, as compared to prisoner sentence under uh, 236A, indeterminate prison sentences, 226A. Another form of, of extended. I mean, so far as the extended sentence is concerned, section 227 related to people who were convicted before the 3rd of December 2012, is that correct? And the replacement, 226A, and the replacement regime for release provisions, so far as the extended sentences are concerned, um, are for those who were convicted on or after the 3rd of December 2012, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Um, so it's not two regimes existing at the same time for extended sentences. One regime replaced by another. It is for 226, 226A. Yeah. The, the, so the comparison is also with 236A, yeah. an indeterminate sentence. And essentially. And, and whilst we're there, can I just double check? In the new regime for 226A, for initial release, there are two changes as compared with the previous regime for the 227 prisoners. One, you wouldn't be considered for release on license until you'd served two thirds rather than one half of the sentence. And secondly, it wouldn't be automatic. It would be at the direction of the pro board, or was that not correct? No, that, that, that's the that, that's the post Torreira change made last year. That was the the statutory change again post the London Bridge attack. So the the change happens in two stages. Um, 
I, I thought, and it is quite important that you tell us accurately, I mean, it's not in the papers, but I did look up online, I think it's um, section 246A, and that appeared to say that, uh, yes, it's 246A, that from the 3rd of December 2012, the parole regime for extended sentences was different, and that it was two thirds plus the parole board direction. Was that not correct? No, no I think, sorry, I apologize. I think my Lord is right. I think it's the, it's the 236A that changed my heart. The 236A two two changed, yeah. Mahal. Yes, my, the my Lord. The 226 had already changed, I think, in December 2012, hadn't it? Yes, we'll, 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 we'll double check that, but I, th I think that is. Uh, my Lord, I have 246A with me that I can perhaps give my letter. We'll, well, we'll, we'll have a have a check of that. But the, the, um, the the argument is, um, and it's a it's a it's a more it's a essentially was two general categories of prisoner, which is um, those released automatically at initial release, and those released following. Or, or, or before they can release requires um, a direction of the parole board. And the way the, the statutory regime works in relation to those two categories um, would be, and so at this, at the material time or in relation to this claimant, he would be, at this event, he, 227 will be in the initial automatic release mm -hmm. category, as would a series of other sentences. There's then a series of sentences that are in. Um, uh, parole requires parole board direction to release, which would include indeterminate sentences, 236, 236A, um, 226A, as but it is no, now. 226 isn't at the same time, 227. 226A replaced 227. I understand your comparison with people sentenced to extended sentences under 227 and indeterminate sentences, but when you say and also, people sentenced under 226A, they are different. They're the people who came after the third of... Uh, but, 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 well, they did, but I don't... We'll, we'll come on to a moment to where the, the, or where the comparison then lies. Or what I, don't, I don't accept that that necessarily means one can't compare... No, I understand that, but, but it is very important. Yeah, You're but not I, comparing I, two people subject to the same regime at the same time. But, the one is a successor regime for extended determinate sentences. Correct, though they may well find themselves, as we'll see in a moment, at the same time being considered by the parole board. On re-release. On re-release, precisely. If the Home if yes, if the Secretary for Justice or the Home Secretary, whoever it is, doesn't grant a release on recall. Co correct, correct, my lord. And so um, the, the, the two categories are um, initial release automatic, um, Secretary of State sets license conditions and can amend them at any time. Um, released by the parole board, direction by the parole board, and whatever different sentences one place in that category, um, parole board sets license conditions, and they cannot be varied without the consent of the parole board. And the issue for our purposes, and one can one can understand the rationale for that, and we say, as we'll come on to a moment, that positively supports our case. The rationale is if you're the parole board considering a release, you also need the release on licence to be able to determine what the licence conditions are, which is how the regime generally splits. The difficulty comes when you've got someone who is released and then recalled. Because what happens then is the parole board is conducting exactly the same exercise asking itself the same question in relation to the individual. Are they satisfied no longer necessary for protection of the public that the prison should be confined? That's the, 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 the test in Brown and the Parole Board. Same whether one was, whichever route one got there, consequences of the decision are exactly the same whatever route one, got, one gets there. Um, <coughs> if, if, the, if the Parole Board considers that to be satisfied, They'll release, they'll direct re-release, and the Secretary of State will have to comply with it. If not, you can stay in for the remainder, remainder of the sentence or life if it's a, an indeterminate um, sentence. But then the difference in treatment is that at that stage, 
the parole board um, on the divisional court's interpretation of the statutory scheme. And certainly we accept, um, uh, we, we, now, we, or we don't challenge the decision that without the Human Rights Act, this is the consequence of the, of the scheme. Um, at that stage, the parole board does not have the power to set the license conditions. They're still set by the Secretary of State, and they can be varied at any time by the Secretary of State. I, I understand the difference of treatment, but focus for the moment only on extended sentences. Don't worry about indeterminate ones. Until the, the 3rd of December 2012, somebody who was an extended sentence person would be released on license to be called could be referred to the parole board who would direct release. And at that stage, the uh, Secretary of State would fix the license condition. The change for extended sentences, and nobody seems to have suggested that was not compliant with the convention. The only reason why you've brought Article 14 in, so far as extended sentences is concerned, is that after the 3rd of December 2012, uh, there would have to be an assessment for release, both initially and on re-release by the parole board, and they fix the condition. Um, well, well, yes, and, and there may be an argument if the only category of prisoner I could compare myself to was 226A, because there would then be an argument, though I, I certainly would have to think it through, that whether you have a different status by being subject... Don't worry about status, but in terms of what's causing the difference in treatment, or extended sentences, it's the fact that you were convicted on a certain date. If you're uh, before the 3rd of December, you wouldn't have had the situation of the parole board directing re-release and fixing conditions before the 3rd of December. You would have had the parole board directing release and the Secretary of State fixing conditions. It changes after for extended yes. sentences. Yes, that, 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 that's correct. With extended sentences, um, the if you had got an extended sentence under 226A, my lawyer is absolutely right. Um, at that stage, it is the parole board that does, will set the conditions both release and re-release. Um, 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 but as I say, oh, that the comparison that we made, whether is significant, may only be in, the, in, in relation to status, possibly justification. The comparison is with uh, any of the sentences in which um, th this, difference, this difference applies. Um, and the question is, does that difference in treatment fall within the ambit of Article 5 and or if we were allowed to pursue it at this stage, Article 8, uh, is there a difference in status as between the appellant and any of, of the comparators? And Is there, if so, if we're right that, thus far, can the Secretary of State show that the difference in treatment is justified? And as I say, it is important that we do say, because we res uh, our respect position is not something that, that certainly the original court uh, dealt with, is that the, what has to be justified is the difference in treatment at recall. Um, that is what, it, it's at that stage that our submission is. Um, well, that's the difference in treatment that we complain of is when one is being released by the parole board at recall. Um, and, and we should also say, and we will also do something, it's in our skeleton at um, paragraph 19, page 23. Um, we don't need necessarily to turn it up, but it's not, uh, it's a difference in treatment that may well have had some significance in this case, because you'll see um, we set out there that there were um, the claimants, solicitors represented nine individuals. Uh, all of whom were uh, terrorism offenders on licence, eight of whom were under various sentences which had to go to the parole board. Um, in all eight cases, the parole board decided that similar conditions to the ones imposed here... But do we know anything about, uh, enough about the material circumstances of those eight to see whether there really is a comparison that can only be explained? By the different well, arrangements. We well, we know, we, know, we know what their sentence was, for example. We know what their risk profile. Some of them were longer, more longer sentences. Some of them were higher risk. Um, but for, for our purposes, um, the, the submission is not, um, and we accept, of course, and this is, and the um, divisional court found this when it was considering substantive proportionality. Uh, we mentioned we we relied on the parole board case, and the, the divisional court said, well, look, proportionality is inevitably a fact-finding exercise. We accept that. The only submission we make 
is that um, he was losing something of potential value in this case. The ability of the parole board to have an independent court look at the licence conditions were imposed. And, and all, all we say about those other cases, the parole board does not in this context, not a rubber stamping exercise for the parole board, it's deciding for itself whether there's a risk. And that is an obvious protection that one gets. It's not just the Secretary of State has to propose the licence conditions, it is an additional protection one has that one can go to an independent court and have the independent court decide um, whether whether the licence conditions were necessary or not. So uh, we don't, for the purpose of Article 14, we don't need to go any further than say this was something of value that he uh, he did not have, and if that was if that otherwise falls in within Article 14, um, that would then be that would then constitute a breach. Um, Mills, turning then to the, the three, or we, we, we failed in this case on three, three bases, ambit, status, and justification. Um, uh, turning first to ambit and status, uh, I'll make some submissions on, on them in a moment. One thing we, we do say is a preliminary matter, and, we, we, and we'll see from the authorities, in fact, it's even, even clearer now following the case of SC in the Supreme Court, but status and ambit generally are low hurdles for claimants, uh, claimants to overcome. And it is, and we'll see this particularly said expressly in the uh, Supreme Court in relation to status, it is very rare, it's few, few and far between, I think, is the language, to find cases where an individual fails at that hurdle. What the courts tend to do is to say, um, not be overly concerned about technicalities of status and ambit, and to get on and consider justification. That's normally where um, the concerns of certainly the Strasbourg Court, but also we'll see in a moment, increase in the domestic courts are. Um, when I was turning then to ambit, it's dealt with in the judgment, paragraphs 26 to 27, uh, page 103 of the core bundle, and in our skeleton, paragraphs 23, uh, to 31, page 25. And they ought to turn up the divisional courts, divisional courts decision on it, uh, 26 to 27. <coughs> and essentially what the divisional courts does is it relies on M against the Secretary of State of Work and Pension. And it considers whether, quoting from Lord Nichols in that case, whether the disadvantage asserted comprises one of the ways in which the state gives effect to convention rights, and says you need more than a, and you need more than a tenuous connection uh, to those rights. Um, and then it held that uh, license conditions um, are helping prisoners transition from custody to freedom. This is uh, towards the end of that uh, paragraph, and says that they don't fall. That's not a uh, way in which the state is giving effect to convention rights. Um, and our submission is, is that, again, and this is only for the purpose of permission to appeal, um, that it is not simply fanciful to say that analysis contains errors of law. At uh, first, uh, it doesn't, we say, take account of the fact that, that, that it's clear from the jurisprudence that. Uh, Ambit should have a wide, generous, flexible, well, that ought to be the approach to uh, ambit. Uh, and you can see that in the, the Smith case, which you have at tab eight of the authorities bundle, page 118. And you also see there that Lord Walker's analysis in M certainly parts of it have been questioned, and they are questioned by the Court of Appeal. And you'll see um, paragraph 61 sets out, refers to Lord Walker's speech in the end case, noticing also at the end the reference to being very closely connected to family life. Suggesting that's neither part of the ratio N nor consistent with the status of authority. And on the contrary, the authorities emphasise the width and flexibility of the ambit test. And that also comes from the Adami and Malta case, refers to the broad and generous approach. 
approach to ambit. Um, the second uh, error we respectfully say is that um, the court uh, erred, we say, in considering this case only through what's described often as a positive modality case. There are two ways in which um, one can get within the ambit of another convention right. One is positive modality, so where the state um, takes some measure in order to show respect for a convention right. It, it can also, it can also arrive, uh, arise um, in the context of negative obligations. If the state does something which interferes or infringes with, or infringes or interferes with, core values that the right uh, is intended to protect. The Division Court only considered this as a positive measure case. But our submission is, we set this out paragraph 27, that it's at least more than fanciful that if one takes, if one considers a, this from a negative interference perspective, that one will say this falls within the ambit of Article 5. And that's because the, the consequence of breaching <coughs> licence conditions is that an individual can be immediately recalled to prison. And we see from the appellant's case that it took, I think, more than a year and a half before his case got before the parole board to consider whether that recall was justified. And that means if you have licence conditions that are insufficiently precise, overly onerous, that has an adverse impact on an individual, which is, we say, directly connected to their liberty because it significantly increases the prospect of them being recalled to prison. And we say that would fall within the ambit of Article 5. We also say um, that the Division Court erred in concluding, even if one took this from a positive modality perspective, that it fell outside the ambit of Article 5. It's, it's not uncommon, and one can look at the um, a particular um, a particular comes from different perspectives, both a positive modality and a negative interference perspective. Um, um, that was what we refer to the Akbar case in our skeleton. Um, this was one about um, certain foreign national prisoners not being able to access open conditions, um, where the court noted you can you can see this um, that sort of provision both as positive modality and uh, negative interference. And what we say in our skeleton, paragraph twenty eight, in this case in terms of positive modality, is that everyone accepts the parole board can recommend license conditions when it's considering re-release, and indeed did so in this case. At the very least, it, it actually thought it was setting the license conditions when it re-released, or directed re-release in May 2018. But everyone accepts, it's now said, well, no, that was simply a recommendation. Everyone accepts the parole board can make that recommendation. Um, but it only has the power to make recommendations in relation to matters, quote, to do with the early release of prisoners. That's section 2392 of the Criminal Justice Act. And, and that was, in fact, one of, this was the analysis of the Divisional Court in Akbar in relation to, because um, parole can also recommend a transfer to open conditions. And it says, well, look, this is to do with the early release of prisoners. It has to be. Otherwise, the parole board couldn't make the recommendations. Um, things that are to do with early release can't be too tenuously connected to the right to liberty. And the reason we say that must be right is that um, what the state is doing in setting up a regime which includes licence conditions um, is providing a mechanism where, whereby people can be released. Um, someone such as the appellant, no doubt most prisoners, would not be released if there weren't licence conditions. So the setting of licence conditions is a way in which um, the state enables people to be safely released who might not otherwise be. So we say uh, it also fits within the positive modality uh, um, view of ambit. Um, uh, finally, my lords, you'll, you'll see we refer to Article 8 uh, in our skeleton argument. I accept that we did not refer to Article 8 in relation to ambit um, for the purpose of Article 14. I'm sure that was an oversight on our part. Um, the only thing we would say about uh, that in terms of whether it can now be pursued is that if the court was otherwise minded to grant permission to appeal, um, there would be no prejudice of any kind in
considering the ambit of Article 8, because we fully pleaded Article 8 on the substance in relation to necessity, proportionality, and certainty. The Secretary of State responded, as I say, it was no doubt an oversight on our part not to refer to it. Um, but I say it was fully considered on the substance um, by, um, by the Divisional Court, um, and it concluded it uh, assumed without deciding that Article 8, um, there had been an engagement of Article 8. Um, but there wouldn't be, with respect to any difficulty of the court going on to consider that whether there was at least some interference within the ambit of Article 8. Um, that's ambit. Uh, turning to status, um, Divisional Court Judgment 28 to 29, um, page 104, on skeleton 32 to 37. And um, our respectful submission on this is it does appear that the Divisional Court had misunderstood uh, the law in this area. And certainly there's a more than a fanciful prospect of establishing that. And we do say it's even clearer now um, when one looks at the SC case in the Supreme Court. Um, as I say, the status being relied on is that, that of being a, a Section 227 prisoner, and the comparison is with... Uh, even that phrase needs analysis. Because you're not a Section 227 prisoner, you're a person who's been convicted prior to the 3rd of December 2012 and sentenced to an extended sentence pursuant to Section 227. That's the position. And the date is key, I think, to the definition of status. It doesn't stop it being status, but it's key, isn't it? Well, yes, I mean, I'd say 227, being a 227 prisoner, I think by definition would be that, that here. But yes, well, well it's right. And by, by that, I'm referring to people sentenced under Section 27, which is, which is in a particular time period. The reason why it's relevant is possibly for something that isn't referred to in the judgment. It's not status that's potentially the problem. If, again, we focus on extended sentences, is uh, the person sentenced to 227 in an analogous position to somebody's sentenced under 226A. One answer might be they're not in an analogous position, but there were different regimes in force at the time that they committed and were convicted of the offences. Favourable in some respects, you get out automatically at half time, but unfavourable in other respects, you have to wait two thirds and need a uh, pro-war direction. So whilst it may or may not be relevant to status, and it wasn't considered here, it may be relevant to whether you're in an analogous situation. Yeah, well, I, I, will, I will think about that when I get past all justification, because often analogous position and justification okay. are, are considered together. But I say, but then um, it may then be um, significant for our purposes that there are also a series of other comparisons um, that are being drawn um, with, with other, other categories of prison. And certainly, I think my Lord. It's only the indeterminate sentences that you referred to this morning. 236A, and I, I will need to check what the dates are of that. It's a different form of sentence. It's a, a I think it's called a special custodial um, sentence. Is the other category that's specifically referred to. It's um, special custodial sentence, which again is particularly on the terrorist offenders. Um, it was also released at the halfway stage. There's now been, that one has been increased to two thirds. So but I, well, I mean, it's quite important. You can't just toss out statements or comparisons, one does need to know the position. So it's section 326A, two, two, three, six, A, and that's in tab 3. Let's just double check that for a moment. I have to, because I have to check this issue hasn't been raised when that It looks like it was 2015, so again, maybe. I don't know whether, what I don't know is if this had a pre, this had a predecessor or not. And that's quite important, isn't it? Because, again, it looks as if this is a regime that was introduced for people convicted after the uh, appellant was convicted. Well, yes, as I say, well, I mean, perhaps the suspicion I would make on this is if we're right otherwise in terms of permission to appeal, this certainly isn't an issue that was raised or considered by the Divisional Court and certainly wasn't the reason... Um, that the case was refused. We would have to go back, I think, and look, trace through. Um, You've got to, I'm afraid, even on appeal, to identify your comparators. And 
you've tossed out categories of sentence, but that's not the whole story because the regimes were not in place at the time, and as far as one can tell, and therefore different considerations may arise. I mean, they, they may, I suppose, but again, where they would arise, um, I think further about the analogous uh, category, but certainly. Um, they may be different for state, as we say they're armed. It's clear that you can be, and in fact, that's what Stott is about. Stott was a two yes, That's why I said analogous. Yeah. Um, it may be analogous. And yeah. it may be relevant to justification. Yeah. Um, but and so do these people, do they get out at two thirds with the parole board direction, the two, three, six, eight ones? Or is it automatic at one half? It was one half with the parole board, and I think post Terrera, it's two, three, six. It so is two thirds. So when it came into force in 2015, it was one half, but not automatic. You needed the direction of the pro board. Is that correct? Uh, I, I would have. I would have to check. But I. And then it's changed at some stage. You refer to something called Terrera. I don't know what that oh, is. Oh, is that? If, oh, well, from the act, it's an act that was passed after the London Bridge attacks, which changed various prisoner sentences. Um, and one of the things it did was change the. Special custodial sentences from halfway to the two thirds third points of re retrospectively, so it's anyone, including those who are convicted before. Um, my Lord, on status, we do respectfully say that is a um, is an error or was an error of analysis by the divisional court. What the Div divisional court's view was that it said that. Status cannot be defined solely by the difference of treatment complained of, and then said, um, save for the treatment complained of, the appellant is in a material identical position to his to the comparator. Um, the position, my lord, we say, and we set out in our, in our skeleton from the authority, including Stott, which is what the analysis was based on, um, is that you can't get status merely by pointing to a difference in treatment. You can't say um, X and Y were treated differently. That's sufficient. What you have to do, there has to be some status by which X and Y can be differentiated. Some form of what's said sometimes classification, some sort of character, identifiable characteristic is the language used by Lord Justice of the Negative as he then was in SC. And for these purposes, it is quite clear that being sentenced to a particular form of sentence is an identifiable characteristic. It has a series of different consequences, in fact, not only, um, as my Lord Lord Justice Lewis pointed out, there are a series of different consequences that flow from being subject to one sentence versus another. That is clearly a different classification, different category. One isn't simply describing the difference in treatment complained of. And in fact, in, in Stott itself, the comparison was this was a 226A extended sentence prisoner comparing himself to indefinite, a determinate sentence prisoners and standard Determinate, and his complaint was that he was only considered for release at the two-thirds stage, whereas they were considered at the halfway or the nominal halfway for um, indeterminate sentences. And the Supreme Court there, with um, Lord Carnwood dissenting, held that was a difference in status. Um, the same must apply, we respectfully say, in this case, in terms of comparing at least different sentences to each other for the purposes of status. Um, and for, um, in terms of, their, as I said, I mentioned that the SC, the analysis in the Supreme Court in SC, which we say has um, made the point still clearer in relation to how one deals with status, it's uh, tab 14, page 384 of the authorities bundle. This was the two child tax credit case which the court may be familiar with, and the Supreme Court held. Um, the way in which the regime operated treating differently families with more or less than two children um, was justified, but it did hold um, paragraph 69 to 72, page 384. So there was no different, no difficulty establishing different status. 
69 referring to Lord Justice Leggett's plurality in the, the Court of Appeal, is that you don't the difference doesn't have to have any significance beyond the difference states doesn't have to any significance beyond the matter that you're complaining of. So you have Matthias and people who are in hospital for more or less than 84 days is a different status. The only significance of that is that people lose their disability living allowance. Nonetheless, the Supreme Court held no difficulty holding that to be a different status. And then, paragraph 71, Lord Reed, with whom the others agree, agrees with Lord Justice Leggett's analysis, notice that it rarely troubles the European Court the question of status. Top of the next page. Sometimes doesn't even consider status at all and just proceeds to get on with justification. And then at the end of the paragraph, cases where the court has found status requirements not to be satisfied are few and far between. And we do say, our respect it is clear that in this case um, there is a different status. Um, well, turning next to justification, which is the third issue that the Divisional Court found um, the appellant had failed on, or, or that the, the Secretary of State had established justification, it's uh, dealt with in the judgment, paragraph 30, page 104. And it's, in essence, the last, the last line that deals with justification is the difference between one sense regime and its successor is readily and sufficiently explained as a legitimate, as a legitimate policy choice. But what the Division Court doesn't make clear there, or certainly doesn't identify, is exactly what it is that needs to be justified. And what needs to be justified is the position on recall and re-release. What is the justification for the parole board being able to set licence conditions if the initial release was from the parole board but not where the initial release uh, was automatic? And um, <coughs> in relation to that, no justification or no explanation for that difference in treatment has been provided, save to note that that is the structure of the regime. But isn't the position this, that they decided on the 3rd of December 2012 to move to a different, and in many ways, more stringent regime? We need to look at individual differences of treatment in context. Up until the 3rd of December, at the time he committed the offence and was convicted, this appellant knew that the structure was half time, he gets out automatically, his record gets out, but Secretary of State can change the condition. Under the new regime, there's going to be a tougher regime, although one bit of it is, on your analysis, more favourable. And the position that was taken was not to subject new people, people who are convicted, uh, uh, existing prisoners, people who'd already been convicted, to the new and in many ways unfavourable regime. Um, well, our response is twofold. Firstly, that, that would deal with that immediate, immediate comparison with the 226A, um, but not the wide the comparison with other categories. You only mentioned 236A, and I thought we'd established that that too was a later issue. And, in, and indeterminate sentences. Oh, you want indeterminate as well? Yes. But Stott says you don't compare different sentencing regimes. Not, uh, with all respect, Stott does not say you never compare different no, sentencing No, but it says that it's not, I'm paraphrasing, it said it's not a breach of Article 14 if it's justified and you don't go through the exercise of comparing indeterminate sentences, which are quite different from uh, the extended sentences. Well, our, our submission is that, that, our respect is that that isn't what Stott says. It, Stott says that as a general matter. It certainly says that in the context of why is it half versus two thirds. Mm -hmm. And we can think of various good reasons why it's halfway, for example, for standard determinate, but not for extended, because I mean, that's what the Supreme Court say in stop. They say standard determinate haven't been found to be dangerous. It makes sense to have the two thirds. Um, indeterminate says there is a series of difference, a series of differences in the structure 
of the sentence, which will justify the half two thirds. We say it doesn't therefore follow, uh, one still needs to do the analysis as to what is the justification in this case for not allowing the parole board to set the license condition. What would be the disadvantage? You know, it's not really be nice, though. it's whether it's unlawful. And the fact is, and what you need to address is, if they decide not to apply a new set of provisions to existing convicted prisoners, whether the failure to do that, when the existing system wasn't itself a breach of any other convention, right, then becomes uh, unlawful treatment under Article 14. Well, what, what, what our, our submission is, what I need to emphasize, what is the aim, the legitimate aim of having this particular difference? That, the that's aim is not to subject people to a set of provisions, including that provision. Uh, but also including other provisions which are less favourable to people who, when they were convicted, were subject to a different regime. Um, well, well, uh, uh, our submission not that, altering their expectations. Um, well, our submission is that's a description of the difference. It doesn't explain what aim is being pursued by that difference. One does have to find, and, and our submission goes further than that, is that if one then uh, um, thinks it through, or if one, then, if one then looks at what would be the consequences of the parole board being able to set licence, Conditions uh, when it's determining re-release. Um, not only are there no, it, it, it's impossible to see any disadvantage, any policy reason why they shouldn't, um, but one can see various policy concerns that would arise, which is why the rest of the system... But it hasn't been a problem in convention terms until the 3rd of December, and the only thing you're really complaining about is there is one bit of the new regime that you think is going to be more favourable, may not be. They may impose harsher conditions, but assume it's more favourable. And your real complaint is that when you have a change to a regime, anyone under an existing regime can't be disadvantaged and have worse things attached, but they can get the benefit of bits of the new regime. And if they don't do that, you're saying it's unjustified. And all I'm putting to you is, can the Secretary of State not say, I'm going to change the regime. It's not fair to do that to existing convicted prisoners and upsetting their arrangements. They know what the score is, but I will do it for people who are convicted from now on. And the legitimate policy is not to make changes in a way that affects those already serving a sentence. They may not want to do that, and it may be lawful not to do that. But if that is what they've done, is that a breach, a failure on the part of the state to justify the policy choice? Um, well, yes, if there isn't any particular benefit of not allowing um, the... You've always got to give a prisoner, and presumably anybody else, the positive benefit of any changes in the regime, um, but not the negative ones. You can't say, well, I'm doing a new regime, and I'm only going to apply it to new ones. Once you've got any part of the thing that's beneficial, it must be extended, or there'll be unlawful differential treatment. No, it would, it would depend on what the specifics are. It depends whether it is justified not to extend, if there is some good reason not to extend. It's assuming, uh, firstly, of course, there, there's the argument about other categories of prisoners as well. Um, you've heard, had my submissions on indeterminate sentence prisoners. But in relation to, even if one is just doing the comparison, assuming they are a different status at a different time, what one would have to justify is saying, well, um, because you've got this advantage, you're going to have the, this disadvantage. It's not, our respect for it's not enough simply to describe what happened. One needs to say, what is the policy aim? But the policy is, as I've tried to explain, when you make changes to the regime governing release, you apply it to people from the who are convicted from that state. The reason being that it's seen as fair and appropriate that changes to the regime, and it's a total regime, uh, apply from that state. That's the, the, the policy. It's right to change it, it's right to put in two thirds, so the Secretary of State's third, but it's not right start applying that backwards. That's the point. And I suppose, I suppose my, my submission, the, the submission is why? Why is it not right? What is the, and there has to be an aim pursued, and, and well, you have my submission, our, our submission is not, the aim cannot simply be uh, we're changing the sentence. There has to be some aim, um, there has to be some reason why this particular change, and, and the reason we, we um, highlight this particular change is it is almost impossible to see what good reason there is. But, but you're, you're comparing apples and pears mm. because you're, it's not legitimate to, it's not justified to 
compare extended sentences with indeterminate sentences, which are a different regime with different qualities and aspects. And the court doesn't look at one and say it's got to be the same as the other. And I don't understand why, when you're now comparing one regime for extended sentences with a later regime for extended sentences, the court is any more entitled to say, well, one regime is better than other, another, and they have to be the same. Because as my Lord has indicated, one applied to a group of prisoners pre-3rd of December, and the other applied to a group of prisoners after the 3rd of December. And, and it's not for the court to say, well, one was better, worse, or um, less favorable. The fact is, they were different. And the, 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 the Secretary of State decided not to change all the conditions of the previous regime. And I, at the moment, I can't see why that's not a perfectly justified policy decision. It's not for the court to interfere with it, is it? Well, well because um, that would, we'd accept that, or at least the court would be very slow to interfere with that, if it was, if this was something that appeared to have been thought through and there was some reason for not. Well, how do um, we assume? I mean, you're, that's, that's sort of assuming the, against the government that it doesn't think through what it's doing. Well, well, I mean, well, no, no, the, the, the government uh, does, makes policy changes, makes, introduces different sentencing regimes, perfectly entitled to do that. It tweaks and changes in order to uh, achieve uh, policy aims. We can't assume that it didn't think about this, can we? Well, the only reason I say that is that um, it is very hard to see what the what aim is being pursued you by... You to look at the transitional provisions attached to the commencement order that brought the provisions of the 2012 Act into force. There are complex provisions governing different things. For example, whether the regime could be changed for people who are unlawfully at large as opposed to people who are in custody and so on. It's perfectly clear that consideration was given to a whole variety of areas on the basis of the legislative material alone, not all of it in the bundle before us, which shows that the government considered the following question. To what extent should alterations be made to the existing arrangements for already convicted prisoners? And that's why you have schedule of transitional provisions. Um, well, I, I don't know I take that other than to say, I mean, our, our submission is the reason I made the submission, it's um, not clear this was thought through pursuing any matters because it is very hard to think of a reason why, if you take the, the appellant's case, when he's being considered by the parole board in May 2018, it's trying to decide, is can this man safely be released on licence? It is very hard to see why it should not also. It did that before December. If he'd been, uh, if he'd been, it wouldn't have happened on the facts of your client's case. But the same system applied before. If you're looking at why not do it, prior to the 3rd of December 2012, people who were recalled to prison had release, in some cases determined by the parole board, with conditions fixed by the Secretary of State. That was the system. The Secretary of State varied them as changes emerged, as there were new terrorist threat ranges, rather than saying, well, we're fixed with what the parole board has done, four years ago, we've got to respond and we've got to change the conditions and address the new risks. Um, um, well, yeah, the, 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 the submission would run at, our submission would run at any time, at any stage. It would also, we'd have to be comparing ourselves, presumably, to someone different. But if, if this case had appeared before the regime had changed, the question is still going to be, what is the reason? Oh, but you keep saying there's no good reason for the parole board not to fix it. And I'm saying nobody complained about the situation that existed before. And it was not said before that there's something inherently wrong about one body taking a decision on release and another about a license condition. And that becomes even more apparent when you're talking about potential variations, which may be in response to a change of circumstances, such as extremism, and we don't know how it works, and suddenly something changes our understanding of it. Um, but oh, no, the, the submission would be you would simply need to compare oneself to someone else. But even if one was, even if one was dealing with the period, um, well, bef when the section two two seven was in force and at the applicable time, 
um, that would still, if there are other prisoners who are be it where they're released, they're re-released. That shows it depends on a comparison. It shows that there's nothing inherently wrong about a situation where release is determined by one body, but conditions and variations and conditions are dictated by another. There's nothing inherently wrong in that state of affairs. It is the happenstance of the ability to compare that causes you to raise Article 14 problems. Well, our submission was would not, we would say there is something inherently wrong in the sense it's different from any good reason for it. It only becomes relevant when one gets to Article 14, because otherwise it's, it's hard to see why it would be unlawful. So our submission would be it, it always is something that is very hard to see how it is justified, even if one's not making a comparison for the parole board to be trying to decide whether to release someone on licence, but not being able to determine their, <coughs> their licence conditions. Um, it only becomes a breach of Article 14 when one can make the comparison. But at that stage, one's still asking the same question, what is the reason for it? So that's our... Um, so do you mean what, a breach of Article 5.4, a breach of Article 8? No, as a, even before... If you... well, no, as I said, it is difficult to see why it would be unlawful. One can have all sorts of things where there isn't a good reason for them, but they're not unlawful. Article 8, it's not right that somebody's um, ability to go to gatherings, weddings, and so on, is dictated by the Secretary of State. It should be dictated by the parole board. You could put the same thing in substantive terms in Article 8. If the inherent complaint is about a bifurcation of responsibility for release and conditions. Well, or perhaps, I say, we, we didn't put it in those terms, but it is not, our, our submission would be, this is, there is no good reason to have that bifurcation. And it becomes, Article 14 becomes an issue if we're able to compare if there are others I think, I think we're going round in yeah. ever increasing circles, Mr. Squire. Well, yes, I don't, I don't think I have We've got the argument. Yeah. Um, and I think maybe if you, looking at the time, you might want to move on to your ground four. I do, not, yes. Yeah. Um, certainty. Uh, certainty is our ground four. It's ground four of our appeal, ground uh, four of the judicial review uh, below. Ground four of both, so it's perfect. Very symmetry. Perfect. <laughs> it is. Um, and and you, have you, had, you had permissions. Yes, we did. Um, we have permission on all grounds except for the ground we were just dealing with. Sorry, except grounds one to three. Yes, yes, yes. The, which was ground one. Um, ground one. Well, one. you didn't have, yes, but you didn't have permission for ground five, proportionality. No, we did have permission. You did? Yes. Oh, okay. We have permission for all grounds except for what was ground one, which was the um, one we were just dealing with. Um, legal certainty, uh, ground four, um, concerns the gathering, the condition relating to gathering. Um, conditions not to attend or organise any meeting or gathering of more than 50 people without prior permission uh, of the NPS divisional head of public protection or the LDU head. And their uh, LDU head is local delivery unit head. Th these are both relatively senior members yeah. of the probation. It's not simply calling up your offender manager um, to get permission. And the key question is, is it sufficiently certain what a gathering of more well, I mean, that's, a, that's not the key question, really. The key question is, is the condition sufficiently certain? Is the meaning of the condition yes. sufficiently certain, read as a whole? C correct. Yeah. Um, correct. Um, and the, the, but the question, uh, the reason I mentioned gathering is it's not, um, the concern isn't with, for example, meetings, which seems to have a, a clearer meeting, and it's, and it's particularly with, it's attending gatherings. Attending or organising gatherings. Organising. So there's an element of uh, organisation involved in a gathering, and there's an element of association with others at a gathering. Well, the, the requirement is not to attend or organise a gathering. Um, we'll come on to whether it's correct that in the word gathering has a, a, a connotation of organisation, because that's, um, as we'll note, the, the division court's conclusion. But the issue is, um, or the particular concern is, the certainty of the requirement. Um, we accept again to organise something has a yes. we relatively uh, all I'm saying is that if you're attending a gathering is the condition read as a whole presupposes that that gathering is something that is capable of being organised because if you organised it you could be done for breach of the condition unless you're saying e you can have an unorganised gathering and attendance of that is caught yes, yes. Well, that would be right yes you could have an organised or unorganised gathering if you organise the gathering that would be caught under that limb if you attend an organised or unorganised gathering, uh, it would also be called. Um, 
Well, it was the, the legal framework we set out scarce at 51. It's, none of that, I think, is disputed. It's uh, under both Article 8 and the common law, there's a requirement for sufficient certainty in licensed conditions. Um, and, and we do say certainty in this context is particularly important, and, and, and arguably, certainly equally, but perhaps arguably even more so than for a criminal offence, because the consequence will be, can be immediately, immediate recall to prison by an executive order, by a decision of the offender manager. And as we've seen, a person can then end up uh, in prison for, say, over a year, year and a half before the parole board will consider the case. So in those circumstances, and again, I don't think this is disputed, it's of real importance both for the individual and those who are supervising the licence to know exactly what is, is and isn't permitted. Not unlike an injunction. Yes, probably would need to be um, yeah, sufficient. Again, it needs to be certainty. understood. Otherwise, it can't be enforced. If it's not understood, it's not fair. Yeah. But, but what's, what's unfair or, or unclear about this? I mean, uh, it seems to me, when you understand that the meeting or gathering must be of people doing the same thing, then it's clear. The, the fact is, it's a, he's not to organize any meetings. And he's not to attend any meetings of more than 50 people. A meeting means people there for all, for the same purpose. And he's not to attend or organize gatherings of 50 people for the same purpose. So if they're in the cinema, they're all there to watch a film. And he can't attend a gathering of 50 people. But if he's in a restaurant having re dinner with his wife, and there are two other people having dinner with his wife, he can, because he's not at a gathering of 50 people. He can go to Tesco because he's not there for the same purpose. He's doing his shopping and they're doing their shopping. Okay. But it's it's perfectly obvious what this means. I mean, I don't see how you could express it any more clearly. Oh, well, my lord, for example, going to a restaurant of more than 50 people, whether that is a gathering... Now, just, just uh, it's perfectly mm -hmm. obvious. He's there for the purpose of having dinner with his wife, not, not for the purpose of having dinner with 50 people. people. He happens to be in the same place as the other people, but he's not gathering with them unless he's gone for a wedding or a Yeah, if it's party. a wedding, then of course he's gathering with the, all the wedding guests. Um, well, let me make um, three submissions, if I can, in relation to, to, to that, or to that understanding of the, um, the, the divisional court's understanding of it. First, um, it's quite clear, we say, that that wasn't the purpose of this condition, which may well explain why there was such confusion, which I think was accepted, in his offender managers explained to him what it was that he could and couldn't do. Because the concern here... Well, that doesn't affect whether it's clear or not. Well, well, if one doesn't know what it's aimed at... It's obvious what it's aimed at. It's aimed at the Manchester bombing. It's aimed at the Millennium Stadium in Cardiff. The danger is, or the fear is, that somebody is going to carry out an atrocity they wear a suicide bombing vest or they take a knife or a gun to a place where people are congregated to strike terror, as the name implies, into the population at large. That's the purpose, isn't it? Well, no, that's absolutely the purpose. But for that, there is no requirement. And indeed, it would be a very odd distinction to draw between an organised gathering and crowds of people doing Christmas shopping. Well, you can't stop every outbreak. It doesn't mean that the ones you can stop or that you have taken steps is uncertain. It may be that people will go on the news if somebody carries out uh, an attack in the co-op in the Ronza and say, they should have stopped him shopping as well. It doesn't mean that the prohibition, insofar as it goes, is uncertain. Well, we'll just start with that first point. Um, so if I can make it good, is that certainly the, the purpose was precisely the one my Lord identified, mm -hmm. which was any form of, essentially any form of crowds or people gathering. But it doesn't it. say that. And when we it, 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 it's, it's, a, it's a nonsense to, to just use, pick a formulation for a purpose out of the air when it says something different. Mm -hmm. The purpose was not to attend, to get him to make sure for the purpose, for the reason my Lord gave to stop terrorist attacks, not to attend or organise any meetings or gatherings of more than 50 people without permission. That's the, what he was asked not to do, required not to do, and the 
purpose was to stop terrorist attacks. He could also have been asked not to go shopping for the purpose of stopping terrorist attacks, but he wasn't. Well, yes, the, the only submission is it doesn't, this comes from the, the Secretary of State's evidence what the purpose was rather than. Yes, um, well, and let's look at it then. Um, Show us what the Secretary of State Page 187 of the supplementary fund. This is <coughs> when it said Mr. Reid, who was the one who was essentially responsible for formulating the, the conditions. Paragraph 18. And he explains, well, there's one condition about not going to the centre of London. Um, this is the last two paragraphs. And then the last sentence. Yeah. Well, you've got to read the whole of it. The proposal for a large gathering on the most likely target, dealing immediately with the highest threat. Yeah, no, the, the purpose, and I'll come on to the point about does that mean if the purpose is one thing, but the, the condition is clear, but what yeah, it's yeah. aimed at, what it's seeking to do, is crowds. Is crowds. And I entirely accept what is said to me by, um, by Lord or Justice Lewis, one can entirely see what the rationale for that would be, given the nature of indiscriminate attacks that have happened in relation to crowds of people. Um, the difficulty is that, of course, you can't have a condition that simply says, don't go near. And whether you can or not, you've got this condition. And your allegation or contention or submission is that it's uncertain. You're yes. going to make three submissions. The first one is, it's not clear what the purpose is. What's the second and third? Um, yes, and, and just my final code to that is, and that is why you end up with the offender managers, or one of the reasons you end up with the offender managers, there were others, not hanging out of any sense of what this condition was there to do. Yeah. What's the second, the second submission is yeah. that um, if this deals with organised gatherings, mm -hmm. um, what you end up with is the word gathering being used in this individual's license in what is clearly two quite different ways, because there's another condition that deals with gathering. Um, if you, you have the appellant's license, page 367 of the core bundle, You've got license condition 16, which is what I'm dealing with. Mm -hmm. You've then got condition 20, which is another gathering condition. Now, that seems to be, on its face, a significantly broader condition, because it doesn't have the 50-person requirement. Now, gathering there cannot possibly mean simply any organised group of people meeting together, because that would mean if he arranged to meet his parents in the park, he has organised a gathering. Gathering there has got a definition that's given... So you're not challenging the, in the, the certainty of 20? We're not, and the reason for that is because that... Um, that condition is explained, and this is one of the difficulties, that the condition that's been added um, is not one that appears in the relevant policy. It's well, not was, this, was this argued below? It was. Well, yes. Not mentioned in the judgment? It wasn't. Um, the relevant policy that explains this condition because this is one of the standard list of, or, uh, sorry, additional list of conditions which you can get from a menu. It's page, it's the tab 15 of the authorities bundle. face. 
because you don't have, and you'll see the advice there. What gathering means for those purposes is you are told you can't attend an animal rights meeting, for example. And that is sufficiently certain. One can say, well, I'm going to avoid that. That's what gathering means in that context. But in order to get to that result, you have to read in a particular meaning to gathering for condition 20. C correct, my lord. And you, so you read in the, the meaning that the divisional court gave. It says, well, gathering means anything organised. It clearly can't mean that for condition... Sorry. It, no, I understand <laughs> it, that it can't... I, I understand yes. your submission about that. But if you're looking at 20 now, and you haven't challenged 20, no. the problem with 20 is you've got a reading quite a lot. A ga any form of gathering... Uh, Participating indirectly in organising any gathering would be caught. Asking somebody to print wedding invitations would be caught on that analysis. Uh, and they've obviously got to uh, deal with demonstration and website in a different way. They've got to try and say that that condition is geared to the purpose, uh, the terrorist purpose. And, 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 that is fine. and that's why that condition is fine, because someone sits down. And they're, and they're, otherwise, that would be hopelessly broad. But you've got the policy, so someone can look at this and think, um, an offender manager is going to tell me um, you can't go to animal rights meetings or, yeah. or, or whatever it is. So that's fine. The difficulty in our case is you don't have, a, you don't have any policy explanation. You don't that's because it's over 50. The, the point is, you can uh, 20 is aimed at individuals getting involved with other groups that are problematic. 16 deals with something else. You've had things like the Manchester Arena bombing and so on, and they're worried about large gatherings because they presumably are perceived to be attractive to terrorists. They think they'll have more of an impact, create more fear in the population if they explode a bomb in a larger gathering. So for larger gatherings, you can't do it without prior permission. For this, Again, you need the prior approval of your supervising officer rather than a senior officer. Where the difficulty? My only submission is that the word gathering must mean something different in the two conditions. That's my only submission. I don't see that at all. Why? I don't understand that either. Why? Why do? Because if gathering in paragraph twenty meant any organised meeting of people, any time you arrange to meet people, then meeting three people in the park would be a gathering. Yes, it might be, but it's not a gathering of more than 50 people. No, no, but it would be a gathering that falls foul of paragraph 20. Yeah, but if, if it falls foul of paragraph 20, it's nothing to the point of whether it falls foul of paragraph 16. No, no, but my only point is that gathering must mean something different in the two provisions. Yes. That, that's, and that, that's, the certain, that's the certainty of... I mean, it's because it's not an uncertain. It's, it's a specified gathering. You can have a gathering of two people or a gathering of ten people or a gathering of a hundred people. They're all different. Gathering is the same. I just don't. I don't get it, Mr. Squires. It's a. It's 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 just. As far as I can see, just picking holes in a condition, which is very readily intelligible. You do not attend or organise get-togethers of fifty people at all. Anywhere. Um, well, that, that then takes me to my third submission, which I will attempt to make, which is that um, we say that is not sufficiently clear. It is not sufficient, and what it does, our submission is, is it moves, it simply relocates the difficulty to the words organised gathering, because that's the interpretation the divisional court gave to it. And our submission is there are a whole range of different everyday, um, everyday matters, which it will be entirely unclear, get, getting on a crowded bus, whether that's an organised gathering or not. You're not in association with the others. It's, there are going to be hard cases where you've got to draw the line. Uh, going to a train station or a bus, you're not participating with others in a common purpose unless you see the catching of a bus or the catching of a train, the same thing. When you go to a cinema or a concert, it's organised for one purpose, to hear Ariana Grande or uh, to watch, I don't know, the latest James Bond movie. But well, no, this is precisely different because if you get on a bus, if you catch the 11 o'clock train to go from Cardiff to London, why is that any different? Why is it's that any not different? an organised gathering. It's people turning up to get on a bus. What's organised is the running of the bus service, not the gathering. I mean, there has to be reasonable yes. certainty, Mr yeah. Squires. It's not absolute certainty because in the Chancery Division, 
whence I hail. We spend all our time talking about certainty. But this is really not a discussion about how many angels can stand on the point of a needle. This is a discussion about whether this defendant understands reasonably certainly what he can and can't do. And what he can and can't do is he can um, go about his lawful business, but he may not uh, attend or organize any meetings or any gatherings of people if there are more than 50 people there. And that's pretty simple to me. And of course you can um, spend the next week arguing that there might be gray cases. But the reality is that if, if it were sufficient to challenge every condition which could conceivably with the endeavors of counsel uh, be identified as having something that might be a little tiny bit um, unclear, that's not what it's about. We're looking at the main body of things he's not allowed to do. And that's clear as, uh, as, as I would say, as a pike staff. Well, I mean, I say, but my submission is this, if one starts to think about the things that fall within that grey area. It is a very large number. Well, what are they? Well, have you given me one yet? I've got to admit, I, don't, I don't understand the difficulty with the bus or the shopping centre because you don't talk about attending or organising on a bus. A bus. Or atten attending a shopping centre. Or, or gathering at a shopping centre. You, you talk about, you might say, I'm going to attend a cinema or attend a, um, a, a, a concert. You don't talk about attending on a bus. I'm not sure, but, but again, well, ask me, I'm not sure you would say, I went to a cinema, I was in a gathering of more than 50 people. Why not? Um, well, you, you would be attending a cinema. But, but attending, you would know, there would the be word. 50 people there. So yeah. it's problematic. I mean, that's the problem. It is, it is, it's really about purpose. And, and that's what you get out of meetings as well. Meetings okay. it is, is relevant when you say meetings or gatherings. Whether or not I know I'll be accused of dancing on the head of a pin or coming up with, 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 with uh, but it was just like one cannot think of them going to an art gallery, going to a, attending a Christmas fair. Um, is that a gathering? Um, is it not? If one, why is it different? What is a paper? Christmas fair? If a Christmas fair is simply a shopping um, area, it's not. But if yeah. one pays for a ticket, it become. Well, well, the, the reason yeah, I make it. If you pay for a ticket and you, then you the go yeah, into the organization. That's exactly what the original court said. If you pay for a ticket, then it's an organization. Well, so that's an example, but that obviously, again, can't be the, the defining. That no, it's not the defining term, but it's pretty obvious. If you're going to attend a ticket, buy a ticket to do something, you're doing the same thing as everybody else who buys a ticket. Um, but but the reason. If the reason I give on all these bus. examples is one, one can think of an enormous number of things that fall, we, as our especially, in the grey area, which are simply every day. If one passes a busker playing and there's a crowd gathered around, are you at a gathering? It's organised. Someone has put the, the event on. If there's 50 people standing around listening, is that it's, an organised gathering? It's obvious. You've got to be a bit careful if you're subject to this condition, because if you go to Speaker's Corner and you're listening to a speaker and there's three people or ten people there, you're OK. But if 50 people turn up, and start listening to the speaker, you'll be at a gathering of 50 people. It's pretty obvious. Okay. And, you've, and you've got to watch out. I mean, it's, it's not intended to be unrestricted. It's, no, it's not. The, and the Bible, absolutely. The, the complaint isn't here um, restriction. It is the number of circumstances we say in which um, you will have, find two different people will reach a different conclusion as to whether something is a gathering. If there's a large number of those categories that are simply everyday things, that is a problem of certainty. For someone, someone has to live under this, someone has to avoid it, and the offender managers have to know exactly what someone can and can't do so they can take them uh, back to prison. And our submission, well, you, I think you, you have my submission, is that one can, um, I won't keep trying to come up with more and more, uh, more, yeah, more examples. I mean, I think you, you understand it's a matter of impression very largely. Um, well, yes, as I say, our submission is one, one does I've got, got various other ones here. So, say, art gallery is one, a happy hour in a restaurant. There's all sorts of different things where the there is. The restaurant is the same. You know, you're taking advantage of a special offer, but you're not gathering together. Clearly, if you took a bomb there and blew it up, there would be a problem, but it's not because of the condition. Yeah. But again, we would struggle in between us going to a cinema with people you don't know and going to sit down and have uh, a meal, a happy hour meal. In any event, I've, well, I've made my submissions. Made made look, well, I think you've made your Um, 
Well, I have no further. Thank you very much, Mr. Spies. Mr. Sheldon, um, we're not going to restrict you to the eight minutes that uh, this <laughs> requires has left you, but um, I think you can be reasonably brief, I imagine. Yes, my Lord. I'll, I'll certainly endeavour to be so. May I start by making two, I think, one sentence observations on ground four before I move on to uh, the others? Uh, my Lords, the, the first is that although a significant amount of time and energy has been spent thinking up hypothetical examples of potential difficulties, um, the Court may think it's telling that at no point, either below or before this Court, has any attempt been made by the appellant to identify how this condition should be formulated in order to catch what it was clearly designed to catch, which was situations such as the one that arose at Fishmonger's Hall, whereas when someone went to a gathering of more than 50 people, sought to carry out a mass terrorist attack. And the fact that that attempt hasn't even been made by the appellant, in other words, how this... They probably don't want to do the, your work for you. <laughs> maybe, maybe so, my lord. The, the, the second very brief observation is that um, in addition to the condition itself, and as the divisional court identified, the appellant was always able to contact the offender manager with whom it is noted he had an excellent relationship. Of course was in virtually daily contact by telephone for some of the period. And uh, if he was in doubt, he could ask. And the, um, the offender manager could presumably contact whichever the person it is that gives permission. If the offender manager was in doubt, they could contact and would have the means of contacting the senior person in the... Qu quite, quite so, my lord. Quite so. Yes. Um, well, that, unless um, you, you wish me to deal with it in any further detail, is all I propose to say about ground. Very helpful, thank you. Uh, can, can I then deal with, um, very briefly, with ground five, the proportionality ground and the duty of candour? Yes. Um, two points, my lords. Uh, the first is that uh, the issue now raised by the appellant, namely Usman Khan's behaviour in prison, uh, has no material bearing, no relevance whatsoever on any of the issues that The uh, comparison between Usman Khan's behaviour and Omar Latif's behaviour whilst in prison formed no part of the underlying decision making that was under challenge. That's the first point. Uh, and the second point is that, in any event, the Secretary of State made the position uh, entirely clear uh, to the appellant and the court as to what uh, reliance was placed upon Usman Khan's conduct uh, and how it was relevant to the case uh, he was put in. My Lords, I'll, I'll develop those two submissions very briefly, but, but before I, I do so, could I just make this general observation? Uh, it, it is always um, a challenge, the Court may think not a challenge that is always met, to conduct judicial reviews of this sort proportionately and sensibly. The hearing bundle in front of the Divisional Court was 1,900 pages long. Uh, the Usman Khan investigation, which led to the conclusions upon which my learned friend relies, took two months uh, mm -hmm. uh, and it involved a quantity of documentation which was dealt with electronically but would conservatively fill 50 Libra Arch files. 50? Uh, uh, at least, my At least. Um, I, I, I acted for the for, for MI5 in the inquest as it happens. The, the Mercury intelligence record, so the one part of the prison records of Usman Khan, uh, was three and a half thousand pages uh, long. The uh, uh, evidence upon which my learned friend relies, uh, the high point of which perhaps is the return to his old ways intelligence that was obtained shortly before Usman Khan was released from prison was the result of an exhaustive PII process. The nature of that intelligence was of the utmost sensitivity. It was gisted in the way that it was disclosed into the um, inquest through a process involving the security service uh, uh, in the usual PII way. And the suggestion, as, as now seems to be put, that this could have in any way been undertaken in over the weekend following the Fishmonger's Hall attack 
when the public was rightly concerned about its safety in light of the fact that a terrorist offender on license had conducted an attack. The idea that this could have been done in any form at all as part of the decision making in this case is fanciful. And so to reverse engineer a, a candor argument in the way that my learned friends have sought to do by taking the product of a two month investigation and then seeking to spin in some strand of relevance back into the arguments uh, in a judicial review undertaken before it had even happened is in my submission illegitimate to start with. Uh, that having been said, um, first point, uh, I I irrelevant. My Lords, you will, have seen the, you will have seen from the judgment what the live grounds of challenge before the Divisional Court were. Um, can I very briefly summarise for the purposes of making good this submission? Ground one was the ultra vires uh, statutory <coughs> destruction argument. It should have been the parole board that set the conditions, not the Secretary of State. Absolutely nothing to do with Usman Khan, that statutory construction. Ground six, which was the next ground that the court dealt with, was the procedural ground. The offender manager should have been more closely involved in the decision making process rather than her manager. Absolutely nothing to do with Usman Khan. Ground two, ground that the claimant won on right to make representations before a decision is made against you. Absolutely nothing to do with Usman Khan. Ground four was the one we've just been looking at. How, um, does condition 16 meet the test of legal certainty? Again, self-evidently nothing to do with Usman Khan. And then finally, ground three, which was the proportionality argument, which was on the um, position as it stands now, this is paragraphs 55 to 59 of the judgment, in light of the situation as it stands now, is condition 16 still justified? Uh, and that got the court into the detailed analysis of the ERG 22 plus risk assessment guidance my Lord Lord Justice Lewis um, identified. And the question of whether post that uh, assessment in August, September 2020, Condition 16 was still proportionate. Also, nothing to do with Usman Khan. Uh, and so the, the idea um, that there should have been disclosure of Usman Khan's um, prison uh, records, and let there be no debate about this, my lords, forgive me. Um, my learned friend now disavows any suggestion that this would have been a big disclosure exercise. The request that was made as my laws will have seen from the correspondence, was for disclosure of the available information relating to Usman Khan. Not a, a one-sentence summary of how you think Usman Khan's been getting on, um, which might have been a different request, which might have met with a different response. It was to give us all the available information about a terrorist prisoner who's been in prison for nine years and has been on licence for a year after that, of which there was a vast amount, much of it said. Uh, so that's the first point, it had nothing to do with the case. Um, s second point, if necessary, is that the position was, as we've set out in writing, made abundantly clear. I accept, uh, and um, for what it may be worth, apologise for the fact that the position was overstated in the summary grounds and the detailed grounds. Uh, reference was made to his progress on licence, but it was also made to the fact that he progressed well through prison. But by the time we got to the hearing, that had been comprehensively addressed in our skeleton argument, in the evidence of Hannah Williams and Albert Reed, and in correspondence, and my lords have seen the 18th of November letter. We made it perfectly clear um, to what extent we relied upon or, or reference was made to Usman Khan's behaviour um, whilst on licence. It is accurately reflected in paragraph 11 of which makes no reference to prison whatsoever. The 18th of November letter was in the bundle, page 1602, the correspondence section. Uh, it, the letter identified to my learned friend, it was entirely open to him to bring this to the court's attention if he wanted to do so and, 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 and um, remind the court that we'd made this concession, didn't choose to do so. 
but it didn't choose to raise the issue at all. It certainly didn't seek to make a specific disclosure application for the hearing. Uh, and the reason he didn't do any of that, I would venture to suggest, was because he knew full well that this had nothing to do with any of the issues in the case. Um, Just to remind me of the dates of the hearing and the dates of the inquest, where, when the inquest had begun. Uh, the, the, in, the inquest began in April um, uh, 2021, well, yeah. my lord. Um, I, I don't have the precise date, I'm afraid, to hand. And then it ran until, I think, mid-June. I think it was the 12th of April 2021. 12th of April. I'm very grateful to my late friend. Uh, and our hearing before the divisional court was the 3rd and 4th of February. So the hearing came before the inquest opened? Yes, and the judgment was handed down two the days 14, after it opened. Yeah. <coughs> so they couldn't have known um, about anything from the inquest really at the stage of the hearing because it hadn't no. happened and presumably in the first two days nothing had happened to cause them to go back to the court and say hold on a moment so no. we can't rely on that the, 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 fir the, first, the first two weeks were as you would imagine on reconstruction yeah. of, the, of the event yeah. uh, and, and my lords uh, uh, again without, um, without, without wishing to give evidence but you've seen I think quotations from the jury questionnaire the jury questionnaire identified that as a matter of fact the jury should take into account that there was zero intelligence to indicate that Usman Khan was planning an attack and they were directed to take as a fact that he had complied with all his license conditions whilst in the community for 12 months leading up to the attack now the jury concluded that particularly for the purposes of the crucial MAPA meeting, which permitted him to go to London unaccompanied, concluded that there was insufficient consideration of the risks and insufficient information sharing between the um, agencies. But to extrapolate that to the submission my learned friend makes, which was that the Usman Khan attack was foreseeable, is in my submission a stretch. Um, my Lord's. Uh, again, unless unless um, there are any um, issues that would benefit from me going into them in further detail, that's all I propose to say about the proportionality ground. Can, can I then can I then turn turn briefly to to grounds one and three, which are the article article five, article fourteen grounds? Um, well, there's the only two um, the only two particular points that I wish. To to emphasise, in addition to our, our written argument, are, are, are firstly to identify the, uh, the the way in which this aspect of the case was presented to the divisional court, which in my submission is important context, and then secondly to deal with section three, which has rather been neglected, because in addition to my learned friend losing, as he rightly identified he did, on ambit status and justification, he also lost on article three, the divisional court, sorry, section, section three, three, I'm so sorry, section three. With the divisional court saying that um, uh, e e even uh, stretched to its limit, yeah, but section for three could repeal, yeah. you could get section four declaration of incompatibility, and this court of Jury Strasbourg needs to know whether it is or isn't a breach. So, yes, well, well, that ties it, that ties perhaps back into the, the first point, which, uh, um, which is the way in which the argument was advanced, mm -hmm. because declaration of incompatibility was never um, a part of the remedy sought by the. Uh, and I'll, I'll um, if I may, seek to make that good briefly now. Article, the Article 14 argument was introduced by way of amendment post-refusal of permission uh, in three new paragraphs of the claimant's grounds, which are at pages 341 to 342 of the core bundle. We'll see that the, the, the amendment, uh, which starts at page 27 of the grounds, starts at 57A and runs through um, to, fit, well, there are in fact two 57Cs, but the second 57C at page 343 uh, reads as follows If the above analysis is correct, which is largely the one um, uh, advanced by my own friend now on appeal, there's no need in this case for a declaration of incompatibility. The defendant has the power to refer the uh, any matter he chooses to the parole board for advice, 
pursuant to Section 3, it's possible to read that power as being a duty to seek the advice of the parole board in relation to the licence conditions to be imposed on a prisoner such as the claimant on re-release. So the way the argument was put was that Section 3 would enable you to read in to uh, the 2003 Act uh, an obligation of the type for which the appellant now contends. The skeleton argument is at page 191 of the same bundle, or at least the relevant part of it. Uh, paragraphs 44 uh, to 47. Again, no reference at all um, to a declaration of incompatibility. Nor, uh, I observe in, in passing, um, no reference uh, at all to the um, uh, authorities, <coughs> many of the authorities which are now being relied upon. Um, there's not a clear identification of which category of other prisoners he's comparing himself with, or have I missed it? No, there isn't one, my lord. He said there will be other ones, and if they're analogous, the pro board applies, but there isn't the analysis of is this 226A or 236A? No. Or no indeterminate sentences? No. Okay. So, um, l l late amendment to a ground that had already had permission refused on it. And it's fair to say that at the hearing, the focus of ground one remained on the straightforward ultra vires argument, namely it's only the probation uh, 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 parole board uh, that can um, uh, impose license conditions, not the Secretary of State. Uh, and uh, much, if not in some material specs, all of the argument that has been advanced before this court on appeal was simply not advanced uh, in uh, anything like the same way at first instance. I make that point by way of um, observation, not least because uh, the divisional court is criticised at points in my learned friend's written argument for, for, for example, referring to the case of M, the leading case um, uh, on, um, <coughs> uh, uh, on this area of the law, which it is said well, it wasn't, even, wasn't even cited. Um, and, and not only did they rely on M, but they didn't even take account of the gloss on M that we find in Smith. Well, n none of that um, was raised, nor, nor uh, as I was going to point out, before my lord um, already have made the observation, what were the various comparators. Also, when my learned friend says, well, um, the Secretary of State, as he did in writing, or orally, the Secretary of State hasn't, as, as he did in Stott, set out <coughs> detailed evidence to explain precisely why the regimes are different and that that's somehow a deficiency in the Secretary of State's case, it needs to be remembered that we're dealing with a bolt-on amendment to a ground which had already had permission refused on it. And we were only at the stage of seeking, uh, at the only at the stage of a renewal permission application. So we were well before the point of in an ordinary judicial review, the Secretary of State would produce detailed evidence as to tracing precisely why the Section 227 regime was different to the 226 or the 236A or indeterminate prisoners or whatever comparator the claimant ultimately got around to identify. Um, so that's the way the um, argument was put. For the purposes of, of Section 3, as the Divisional Court accurately identified, it is simply not possible to read in to the 2003 Act and a duty on the Secretary of State to, uh, first of all, consult the Parole Board about uh, licence conditions for a 227 prisoner, and secondly, once consulted, apply to whatever conditions the parole board directs. That is the duty for which the appellant contends. And it is not just um, uh, outweigh the regime under the 2003 Act, it is directly contrary to it. 
250 subsection 4 well, provides the Secretary of State with a discretionary I'm so sorry, Michael. Yeah, it's, it's directly contrary to it, as the Provisional Court said. Qu quite. Um, and so, um, Section 3 cannot shoehorn this duty um, into the Act. The only remedy, potential remedy, would be a declaration of incompatibility, which is not just not on the claim form, it's not in the grounds, it's not in the skeleton argument, it wasn't sought before um, uh, the Divisional Court. I accept, of course, that the Court can always make a declaration of compatibility of its own motion, but we're, we're dealing here with an appeal against a refusal of permission. And if the claimant's only argument left standing is, well, I, I should get permission to advance this application for judicial review, because there's always a chance that the Court might, of its own motion, grant me a remedy that I haven't even sought, um, then um, my law's not much left, is, is my respectful submission. So th that's uh, uh, the, the Section 3 point. Can I just um, finally um, uh, uh, deal with the um, exchange between my, my Lord Lord Justice Lewis and my learned friend about why it might be uh, that the uh, regimes under 227 uh, and whatever other comparator you choose to, to take might be different. Uh, and my learned friend's argument that um, there's simply no good explanation for it, and therefore, whether you look at it under status or justification, um, that must be uh, that must be a sufficient way into his argument. My lords, under two two seven, the Secretary of State. Oops, forgive me. For a 227 prisoner, the Secretary of State has a duty, or had at the material time, a duty to release at the halfway point of the sentence. Uh, a convenient place to see the relevant provisions is at pa paragraph 4 of the judgment of the Division of <coughs> Section 247. Once a prisoner to whom this section applies has served the requisite custodial period, Half, it is the duty of the Secretary of State to release him on licence. Uh, uh, under, let's take 226A um, for present purposes, although much the same applies to 236A as well. The duty on the Secretary of State was not to release, but to refer to the parole board. My Lord has already identified the 246A is the relevant yeah. section for a 226A prisoner. And for somebody like Mr. Latif, who was sentenced to 15 years and four months, the relevant provision was that it is the duty of the Secretary of State to refer the case to the board, and then the duty of the Secretary of State to release the prisoner under on licence as soon as the board has directed release. So uh, uh, under the 227 regime, a direct duty imposed on the Secretary of State to release. Under 226, for example, a duty only on the Secretary of State to refer to the parole board and then give effect to the parole board's decision. Now, in that context, um, doesn't it, one might, one might um, ask, make perfect sense? that under the former regime, the Secretary of State should retain responsibility for power to impose license conditions, whereas under the latter regime, the Secretary of State's power should be made subject to uh, the direction of the parole board. What, why shouldn't it be the case that if the Secretary of State has the duty to release somebody at half time, the Secretary of State shouldn't also have the power to impose such licence conditions to manage their risk as he sees fit. It's a coherent regime. It's a coherent... I mean, I don't... My, my Lord, with great respect, I, 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 my primary submission is, is I don't need to establish for present purposes that it's a, um, that it's a coherent regime. I, 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 I um, tuck in behind the divisional court's analysis of Stott, 
and say, well, it's not for the court to, to second guess or analyse. But, well, but if one's looking for a reason, it's, it's, it's pretty obvious. But Robert Scott says he's not complaining about initial release. He says it's fine on initial release. But when it's re-release, if the Secretary of State, as he could, decides not to re-release himself, then he's got to arrange for it to be referred to the parole board. And the parole board then decides to release. And his attack is really on the re-release. I, I, I do understand that, my Lord, but it's only a slight variation or extension on the same argument. Once you're the, sec once you're the Secretary of State who has been fixed with the duty to release this individual at the halfway point of their sentence, without any assessment of the risk they pose, why should you not retain a power to impose such conditions on that individual from time to time as you see fit in order to manage the risk? What, what, why is that? Um, uh, because you complied with your duty and you have released him. We're in another ballpark now. Um, mm -hmm. You record him because you've got another power under 254, I think, to record him. Um, and then you can go to the parole board. So you're not saying to the you're under a duty to release. He must have the power to do those things necessary to make sure he does his duty properly. He's done that. That was last week. This week he's out and he's in again. Well, my lord, I'm next. <laughs> I, 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 of course, acknowledge that that would be that that would be a, a perfectly rational alternative way of looking at it. You you could look at it and say, well, Secretary of State, you discharged your obligation by releasing him. You you had your power to impose such conditions as you see fit. But it's now the parole board's problem because they've they've ordered his re-release and it's now it's now over to them. And and all you should be entitled to do is just give effect to whatever it is they decide. That, that that would be a coherent policy choice, yes. but but the alternative that doesn't make the alternative incoherent. It it doesn't make it incoherent um, to say that as you, the Secretary of State, having uh, as the individual who's been given the duty to release this person at half time, you should retain a power for the duration of the period that they are uh, in the community to manage the risk as you see fit. Perfectly. It's another way of saying there are different regimes. There's a different it complex is. set of policy choices for one regime. When you go to another regime, there's another complex point. And in the Article 14, this isn't somebody being treated badly because of sex or race or ethnicity. It's to do with sentencing regimes turning on when you happen to be convicted for the offence that you've committed. Quite, quite my lord. And, and, and I should say, of course, that, that, that these submissions are made without prejudice to um, whatever detailed evidence the Secretary of State might put in were this appeal to succeed, permission were granted on this ground, and we were um, and we had to go back through all the travaux of LASPO to work out precisely why it was that the regime was configured in the way that it was. Not doing that this morning, Mr. Shell. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, great, I'm grateful to hear that, my lord. Um, my lords, on, on, on the rest of the of the ambit status justification um, uh, grounds, uh, you will have seen from our written submissions that I simply commend the division. Unless I can be of any further assistance, I, I can close my submission. Thank you very much. Well, of course, I've realised it's, it's so late because I took so long, and I'll try and be very, very brief in, um, in reply. Um, firstly, on certainty, the, the submission was made, well, um, the appellant didn't try, and, he's never tried to find out what the condition meant. That simply isn't right. You ever look at the divisional court I didn't judgment. think that was the submission. I think it was that you'd never suggested a certain condition, which um, I don't think you need to. Very well. It, it, it simply, because I think it's not a fair criticism of the appellant. If one looks at 50 to 52, no, he has repeated it's not the appellant's job to write his own conditions. Mm -hmm. no. um, uh, that's certainty. Secondly, uh, duty of candour. Um, the key point uh, is whether or not it was relevant um, that the attack was unforeseeable or not. I appreciate I have to show that that is a relevant matter. If it is a relevant matter, relevant material, then that is an answer to all my learned friends' submissions, because it is not said um, you have to tote, go through some enormous disclosure exercise. You simply have to make sure the court does not have an incomplete picture. And we do say on the foreseeable... Well, you said that in, in yeah. opening, and, and he didn't address that point. Yeah. So, so that, but I say, well, if, if, we're right, if we're wrong on that, we lose. If we're right on that, then that is an answer on duty of canon. Certainly the letter of the 18th of November... Uh, certainly does not take matters any further. It certainly does not give uh, that complete picture. 
Um, but in relation to Article 14, um, there's various what appear to be procedural criticisms uh, <clears throat> of the appellant and the way in which the, the case was run. This was a it was a rolled up hearing on this point before the Division Court, which the um, respondent agreed to. That was canvassed in correspondence. So this was uh, the opportunity to argue this point if we had permission. Um, in relation to the then various criticisms of authorities not being cited, the authority we relied on was Akbar, which refers to all of the various other um, relevant, relevant authorities uh, in this area. Um, it's then noted, um, um, my Lord Justice Lewis noted, that in our pleadings we simply divided the case into two broad categories of prisoner, because our understanding is within those two categories, if you're an initial release, you go down, initial automatic release, you go down one route, if you're an initial parole board release, you go down another route. And the only point we make on that is that that wasn't an issue that was challenged, um, certainly wasn't dealt with, that wasn't a reason for refusing our case. That is the way we put our case. It wasn't said at this stage, you have to identify exactly which categories. Um, there are, uh, no doubt, one could find a whole range of different prisoners who fall within either. That was the way the case was, was presented. Um, um, my learned friend makes various submissions on, on remedy. Well, we, we've dealt with those in our skeleton. I didn't take you to them because if, if permission to appeal was otherwise going to be granted, it would then be appropriate for the court to decide, does one go down a Section 3 route? Um, is there, there's also an argument about Hooper and Section 62B, which we've dealt with. And if not, one ends up with a declaration of incompatibility. And our, our submission is um, ultimately a declaration of incompatibility is a booby prize. It doesn't necessarily need to... Um, or doesn't we say need to plead that separately? That's where one gets to it. One doesn't. The primary submission is this was an unlawful act. It's only if one gets that far, um, the court should consider a declaration of incompatibility. It may, sometimes the court just says, well, we'll record in our judgment the correct I position. I thought as a practice direction by pleading and serving on the Attorney General for declarations of incompatibility. I didn't realize it was a booby prize. Um, you said, well, I've lost on everything else, but I'll have one of those now, please. Um, well, not, not as initially said, it opened to the court at that stage um, to, to, to grant that question. Quite a serious thing. Um, no, 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 I accept, of course, it's a serious thing. We certainly would have asked for one um, had we got to that stage. But I said, the only submission we make at this stage, in, in any event, I've dealt with the Section 3 um, and the um, Section 6 of the Human Rights Act point in our, in our skeleton. But we asked that it would be, that one would not, it certainly would not be a reason to deny permission to appeal if it was otherwise granted, that we didn't specifically plead, um, plead a declaration of compatibility. That's, that's the only submission. And I said it wasn't, it wasn't an attempt to suggest it's, a, it's trivial, but ultimately it's where one gets to if one fails, on, or we, where we would have got to if one failed uh, on the other points. Um, and then the very final point is on, um, on justification. Um, the test isn't whether it's incoherent, if we've got this far, it's for the Secretary of State to show. Um, that the difference is justified and, the, and it's a particularly in relation to the issue of recall. It's at that stage. We can entirely see the justification initially, but it's at the recall stage. Um, my Lords, unless I can assist further. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Price. Thank you um, uh, all for your submissions. Uh, we will uh, reserve our judgment, but only until three o'clock. Uh, when we will um, deliver or hand down our judgments in open court.